everyone and welcome to Discovering Wi-Fi Essentials. My name is Chris Avance and I'm going to be your instructor through this quick micro course we're doing with Wi-Fi training. And here's a little bit about me. So I am a senior instructor. I've been teaching for about the last eight years. I was in IT for about 20 years. Uh, doing all kinds of stuff for all types of customers all over the world and yeah having a lot of fun doing it But my passion today of course is in teaching and helping others uh, Some of the last projects I worked on is a course called Rockstar Network Foundations. It's a new all-original vendor agnostic course uh, I also created a new uh, lab workbook for uh, Wireless professionals who are looking for their CWNA we have actually a new wireless workbook and lab access to a new lab uh, that we built called the wireless range with Wi-Fi training and you can basically purchase the self-study kind of lab workbook and lab access and get hands on time with wireless because although there's these great tools for wired networking to practice your skills until now there wasn't really a self-study way to do that with Wi-Fi so we've created that and that's available at Wi-Fi training long story short I do this a lot I love what I do and I'm gonna try to see if I can teach you guys the some fundamental skills and 802.11 based Wi-Fi in 30 minutes. So let's see how I do. First of all, what is Wi-Fi? A lot of people think Wi-Fi means wireless fidelity. It doesn't. It's a made up word that was coined by the uh, Wi-Fi Alliance. Okay. And it was easier than saying all these slew of acronym soup that Wi-Fi is. For example, if I said, well, that's just 802.11 ABGN ACAV uh, U T R I element basically all that kind of stuff, right? It's a lot easier than saying all that. You could just say it's Wi Fi, so it, was, it, it doesn't really mean anything, it's just easier than saying uh, that's 802.11 slash 40 50 protocols after that, right? It is also the number one network access method in the world today in the enterprise, at home, and in business of all sizes. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is the access method. Whenever we talk about the network access layers, how we initially connect to the network and to the internet. And there's access switches, which are wired devices. And there is access points, which are wireless devices. They allow us to be anywhere and connect, like sitting on our couch watching this video. So uh, this is the thing. It has been the number one network access method in the world since the end of like 2013 or 2014. And it, there's no signs of slowing down. Okay, so we'll talk in a little bit about the whole 5G versus Wi-Fi 6 and all that kind of stuff here in a second. But bottom line is there's no better time to learn Wi-Fi than right now for sure. Okay, so Wi-Fi is another name for a suite of protocols in the IEEE 802.11 working group. Now, we use several bands from this thing called the RF spectrum or electromagnetic spectrum. And we commonly use the 2.4 gigahertz bands and the 5 gigahertz bands. And what that really means, the whole Hertz things, is revolutions of cycles per second. Wi-Fi uses RF or radio frequencies. And so megahertz would be millions of cycles per second. Kilohertz would be thousands of cycles per second. Gigahertz is billions of cycles per second. So your Wi-Fi devices communicate at 2.4 or 5 billion times per second to send and receive data. It is the choice protocol for indoor wireless LANs. Everybody says, oh, well, cellular could replace Wi-Fi. No, it can't. Cellular is a leased service from a service provider. You don't own the infrastructure there. It is also a WAN technology. It is not a LAN technology, and we'll talk about that in a minute, which is why a lot of people refer to wireless as wireless LANs. Okay? It is cost-effective, it's scalable, it's reliable, and it en enables countless advanced use uh, applications. I mean, where would we be today without Wi-Fi? My, my little girl, one of the cutest shirts her mother ever bought her said, my daddy's Wi-Fi is better than your Wi-Fi when she was just a couple months old. So cute. Now, one other point I want to make real quick. Wi-Fi is half duplex. Uh-oh, do we know what that means? That means we can talk, we can receive, but we can't do it at the same time. Ethernet switches have been doing this for a long time. They've been able to do full duplex operations. So if you have a gigabit Ethernet switch, you're actually sending data at a gigabit and you're receiving data at a gigabit, or should I say up to a gigabit? Not necessarily that's always on or always active, but you're able to send and receive simultaneously at the same speed, but not Wi Fi. Okay, we are half duplex. So we can talk, we can listen, but not at the same time. 
it's kind of like uh, you hearing me now nice and clear through either your headset or your speakers. But if I you were trying to watch this uh, video series and you turned on a Megadeth album at equal volume, you'd probably have a hard time understanding what I'm saying versus, you know, Megadeth, right? So uh, hopefully some of you actually know what that is. All right, so wireless architectures, there's a few different wireless architectures I want to talk about. There's WPAN, which is personal area networking, WLAN, which is wireless local area network, WMAN, which is metropolitan area network, and WAN, wide area networking, okay? So where does Wi-Fi live in all this? Well, WPAN is really about the personal area connectivity, okay? And let's make this clear. We're talking about wireless versus Wi-Fi. There's a lot of wireless technologies out there, guys but only one of them is 802.11 based Wi-Fi, okay? And if it's not Wi-Fi, it's usually not compatible with Wi-Fi and could be potentially problematic for us. But there is a complimentary service. It does somewhat interfere with Wi-Fi. It depends on the power and it is used for personal area networking. In fact, Bluetooth was designed and coined this WPAN concept. Now WLAN is where Wi-Fi lives, okay? The wireless local area network. Wi-Fi actually operates at layer one and two of the OSI model, which we know is LAN technologies anyway. WMAN, we might use Wi-Fi for that, maybe some outdoor bridging, okay, to go across a city or a big area, but that may fall under uh, wireless bridging, okay? Wireless bridging or maybe mesh solutions. So Wi-Fi could live there, but that's also where you see those other technologies that are complementary like cellular, things like that. Uh, so, and Wi-Fi and cellular are complementary to each other nowadays, now that we have more capable handhelds that have the ability to choose the best connection for the user, so to speak, but that's a little beyond where we're going right now. Then there's this WAN, which is a wide area networking. And again, you might have some point-to-point -point bridging with 802.11 based Wi-Fi with wide area networking, but most of the time with WAN technologies, we're gonna be moving to something like 802.16, which is WiMAX essentially microwave communications. You can go much further, much uh, faster, basically, with those technologies, which are designed to go, you know, high power outdoor long range, okay? Or maybe satellite, which isn't as fast, but you can get satellite most places, okay? So those are other wireless technologies, but again, we are focusing on the IEEE 802.11 working group, okay? So this is it. This is basically some of the key phi, phi meaning physical layer protocols that define the operation of 802.11 Wi-Fi in the IEEE uh, working group. Okay, so we've got everything here. We did not really talk about 802.11 Prime. That was the very first protocol. Came out in 1997. So if you're watching this video and it's still 2019, we're in October of 2019, right? So some of you should see this before. 2020. But uh, long story short is it's over 22 year old technology. So uh, we weren't going near as fast as we can go nowadays and we weren't near as efficient as we are nowadays. These early wireless protocols guys, they were definitely the cat's meow back then. But nowadays we do much, much better things if properly designed. So 802.11 Prime started it all. It was ratified in 97. Now, whenever we talk about these five protocols too, we always go by the date that the protocol is ratified. Okay, so that's why if you've seen some of these protocols like HT came out, ratified in 2009, but you started hearing people talk about it much, you know, well before the 2009 ratification. Okay, but those were drafts. Those were not actual ratified dates. You also see that 802.11n supports, theoretically, data rates up to 600 megabits per second. However, Nobody built, really built an AP that would do 600 megs with 802.11n. So that's the other thing you gotta understand about Wi-Fi is the IEEE lays out specifications and what is the IEEE doing anyway? Why do we need it? Well, if you remember back before the IEEE came around, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, they create standards. What standards allow us to do is to have different vendors creating different technologies and protocols that can work and interoperate at different layers of the OSI model, okay? And they can be compatible with each other because it's laid out in a standards way. Before we had standards, all the systems that we had were proprietary. So if you bought an IBM uh, mainframe back then, you bought everything from IBM. You bought the mainframe, you bought the terminals, the cables, the software, the Kool-Aid, all things came from IBM at that time, okay? So standards give us the ability to have interoperability. 
and it's a very cool thing that they do for us. All right, now let's get back to these protocols. Uh, same month, same year, 802.11a and b were ratified, okay? And these protocols couldn't be more different, actually. Uh, they're the same and then they're defined under the standards of Wi-Fi, okay? But uh, B, built on to technologies that came out in Prime, and we got data rates only up to 11 megs per second. So data rates only up to 11 megs per second. I had to pause the video really quick. I forgot my pen. All right, so uh, that was good, and that was definitely an evolutionary step from our data rates of one and two with that other protocol we left off here called Prime, okay? Uh, A was released same month, same year, used a much better form of modulation, encoding, and sending data across the spectrum using what's called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, okay? It was used over a new band as well, the five gigahertz band. Actually, it wasn't really new, but it was definitely repurposed for this, okay? Uh, so, data rates of up to 54 megs, so we're getting a lot more speed than the 802.11b uh, protocol that was released. But, you didn't actually see a lot of people going to five gigahertz until just the last few years, guys. And one of the reasons is, is because B would have been backward compatible with Prime. Prime was released in 2.4 gigahertz frequencies only, okay? And that's one of the things that plagues our industry is this ever, you know, quest for backwards compatibility. We all have to talk slower to be compatible with technologies that existed well before the new stuff, okay? And why? You can't really go and tell the, the CEO of Coca-Cola he's got to upgrade every Wi-Fi device on the premise because he's going to integrate the latest solution, right? So... You know, you think about that, that's the infrastructure, that's the supporting infrastructure, that's all the client devices, all the mobile phones, tablets, everything. It just wouldn't be feasible. So, uh, 2003, they stole all the evolution and kind of the, the all the, the new techniques that we were using with 802.11a and they ported them to the 2.4 gigahertz band again. So you get the same rate and same capabilities because we're using OFDM with G. But G could again be backwards compatible with B and be backwards compatible with Prime. So you got data rates here of 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36, 48, and 54. We're just kind of showing you 6 through 54. But you're getting the same features basically that existed several years earlier in 802.11a. Still, this was kind of the new thing at the time. You still didn't see a lot of 5 gigahertz utilization outside of a couple vendors and some proprietary kind of PCM CIA adapters. Integrated chipsets, guys, was just starting around this time. Around early 2000s, we saw integrated chipsets. It was actually a very humble beginning. I try to tell everybody that. Uh, I'll tell you what, though. All of these protocols, we now consider them to be legacy. And I'm talking about A, B, and G, okay? And also Prime because they just didn't have the new capabilities that we saw released in the evolutionary protocol called 802.11n, also known as high throughput. Okay, so n was revolutionary. All the other kind of enhancements to 802.11 Wi-Fi until n, it wasn't revolutionary. It was kind of evolutionary, right? But once we got to n, the revolution started, okay? Then, uh, we got data rates theoretically up to 600 megs. I said that before. Most people only built an AP up to 450 megs, though. AC builds upon the technologies of 802.11n, and the biggest thing it actually brought, the thing that makes me the happiest with AC, 802.11ac, was that I knew if I saw an adapter that supported 802.11ac, I knew it was going to support 5 gigahertz. You see, N was designed to be backwards compatible with everything. So it operated in both the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz bands. The 2.4 gigahertz band, as you're gonna see, has some problems, guys. So many people use these unlicensed bands for other technologies outside of Wi-Fi, and that interferes with Wi-Fi, okay? So there's just not as many of them in the 5 gigahertz uh, frequencies, and we have more bandwidth in the 5 gigahertz space. So you're gonna hear a lot of people say, a lot of my colleagues have written blogs saying, 2.4 gigahertz is dead. And for new designs, you definitely shouldn't be using 2.4 as far as your design goal. But you can't really say that thousands of devices at an enterprise are just no longer supported because it's dead. So we got to make the best of what's around, right? 
All right, so AC came out in a couple waves. Uh, wave one came out, uh, it was ratified, I believe 2013. This, some of this might have changed, I might not have got all the notes right, but bottom line is AC ended up being able to do, theoretically, again, theoretically, almost up to seven gigs, okay? And then now we're about to see another new, new protocol come out called 802.11ax. But instead of this very high throughput, high throughput, and all that kind of stuff, this is about high efficiency, okay? And it does actually bring some new technologies that were uh, are kind of revolutionary again. So N brought a lot of technologies that were revolutionary. We're gonna talk about those in a second, but we haven't really seen any other revolutionary technologies out of 802.11 Wi-Fi until AX. At least that's my humble opinion. But what do I know? All right, so 2.4 gigahertz band. Whenever 802.11 Prime came out, guys, we were given the ability to use uh, channels that were designated by the federal government for industrial, scientific, and medical purposes. Okay, industrial, scientific, and medical purposes. See, the government sells the spectrum that we can use all over the world. They sell it to the highest bidder, basically, which makes them money, and, you know, it's great. We get cellular services and TV services and all other types of services we can purchase because of that. And because of them selling it, and it's, you know, it's only good for a certain area or zone, right? But the government didn't want to stifle innovation. So they carved out some of the frequencies in part of the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and also they carved out some of the frequencies in the 5 gigahertz spectrum, and they slapped a sticker on it saying, this is for industrial, scientific, and medical purposes. Well, whenever the creators of Wi-Fi came out and they wanted to develop the 802.11 protocol, they said, let's use this industrial, scientific, and medical ban. That way people don't have to pay uh, the government to use the radio waves. And this worked out really well because we play in the unlicensed spectrum. Okay, that's where you get the, it is kind of licensed, but it's licensed to be unlicensed, right? So it's, it's kind of a fun thing there. Well, bottom line is Wi-Fi also came out with a couple requirements, okay? The way we're transmitting data across the air in this spectrum requires a certain amount of bandwidth, okay? And depending on the type of transmission we're doing, well, the early wireless protocols, Prime and B, came out with a technology called DSSS. DSSS sprinkles data across a bigger portion of the spectrum, and that helps it avoid interference from narrow band interferers. There's lots of ways to send data across the air, uh, and they chose DSSS. Because if I have something coming out that's doing narrow band interference, man, my drawings are just horrible, uh, that's doing narrow band interference, I could still get the data across. So let's take a look at one way they were able to do a redundant transmission of data across the air. It was a thing called chipping, okay? And what they would do is instead of sending you a zero or a one, they would send you 11 zeros or one. So it would be zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, uh, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And then it would be the polar opposite for this guy. It'd be uh, one zero one one uh, zero one zero 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 one one one, and it might be the opposite of one or the other there, but you get the point. And they would sprinkle each of those bits across this spectrum, and you can imagine that each of these took two megahertz of bandwidth. So the first early protocols that used DSSS as a transmission technique required 22 megahertz of bandwidth. Now, you might be saying, Chris, why are you wasting time talking about this? It's actually very important because the spectrum, the, the channels they gave us are only five megahertz in bandwidth each, okay? And this is part of the big problem with the ISM band or the 2.4 gigahertz ISM channels because they're only five megahertz in bandwidth each, which means if I do a wireless transmission in this band, it's gonna take up several channels. Okay, which gives us, and even though they gave us 13 channels to use in the U.S., that we only got three usable channels out of it because we needed more spectrum. We needed more bandwidth. Okay, all right, so let's continue so far. I see the time, and I, man, it's tough to go over all this in such a short amount of time, but I'm going to try. All right, the 5 gigahertz spectrum, we're given a lot more bandwidth. 
okay? And these come out in what's called unibands. That's the government classica classification for the using these frequencies. Uni stands for Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Bands, and there's three bands. There is two sub-bands in Uni2, okay? Now, we were given this space conditionally that if we saw anybody using radar anywhere in our DFS areas, which you see there, then we have to immediately go off that channel. So we were given more bandwidth and each channel in the uniband is 20 megahertz of bandwidth. If you remember from looking at the 802.11.5 protocols, 802.11 A and G with OFDM requires 20 uh, megahertz of bandwidth. So it's a perfect match basically. And we were given a lot more channels to use. Today we have up to 25 20 megahertz channels we can use in the United States. There's 19 in Europe basically. Now, with the revolutionary protocol 802.11n that we talked about earlier, n brings with it one of the small features that n has. It's not really the revolutionary thing of it, but it is a big step forward, is the ability to bond channels. So starting with 802.11n, we have the ability to take two channels, kind of like link aggregation, NIC teaming, channel bonding. Uh, they're all kind of the same thing. We're taking up more real estate to be able to send more data, okay? but at the cost of having fewer channels available. Now we're gonna talk about the operation in a channel here in just a second, but I will tell you right now, if there's just a couple takeaways you take from this crazy experiment, okay? One is that you definitely need channel reuse to ensure a good user experience, okay? If you have to compete with hundreds or, or, or dozens or lots of other chatty devices that are interfering with your channel or overlapping with your channel or slowing down your channel, it's gonna be bad. So you definitely need channel reuse, all right? Now, those legacy protocols, 802.11a, prime, uh, 802.11b, 802.11g, all those protocols, guys, were what's called CISO, single in, single out. It used a single radio chain, and later on, we got this one feature called diversity, okay? Now, this was still a single transmission or a single reception by the, uh, these devices. However, if I built a device that was CISO that had two antennas, so that means only one person talk at a time. I can transmit, I can receive, but only one person at a time. Well, if you built a CISO device with this diversity antenna, that means you could choose one antenna or the other, whichever one had the best connection for that particular conversation but it wasn't all CISO devices that had this. This was a new technology that was released right before 802.11n came out, at least when it comes to 802.11. All right, next slide, next slide. Oh, there's animation. I forgot about the animation. So it's one uh, station send, one station receive. Now, 802.11n high throughput was revolutionary and it was revolutionary because if i put in an an ap that supported 802.11n it had these new features on it that took advantage of what was our arch enemy called multipath okay whenever we transmit data across the air any type of data it hits walls it hits people it gets absorbed it scatters it bounces it reflects it refracts it does all these fun things and there's a chance that that data could arrive at a receiver at slightly different intervals after it reflects off something and if it does that then it will confuse the receiver okay and it's bad so every CISO technology we had which was 802.11 Bravo 802.11 G 802.11 A all those protocols and Prime especially they were all severely impacted by multipath. But there's these natural phenomenon as waves bounce through the air that if the wave somehow happened to arrive uh, in phase is what we call it, then you would actually get twice the power. You would get better coverage. But there was no way to guarantee that until editor to 11 in. And it's not really even guaranteed, but we're able to do it by using multiple transmit chains and directing the waves towards a client so that the client receives what's called upfade. They get double the signal strength, basically. So it's a great technology. And it, all of these technologies I'm going over right now fall under a suite of new innovation that was released with 802.11n called MIMO, okay? Multi-in, multi-out. 
So this first one, we don't have MIMO. We're able to send and receive, but not at the same time. The second one, we're able to use what's called transmit beam forming, and that's what I was just telling you about. I have multiple transmit chains, and I'm able to transmit using timing uh, and multiple transmit chains so that the signal arrives at the receiver in an up fade condition which gives them better signals performance, okay? It gives them better signal strength and they're able to transmit a lot more data. Now, if we have a scenario where the AP supports 802.11n and the client supports 802.11n, well, now I have a technology where I can use multiple transmit chains and coordinate better across the air. Now, this doesn't mean I'm doing channel bonding, okay? A lot of people think spatial multiplexing means that I'm bonding channels, it does not. Special multiplexing means I'm using multiple transmit chains and multiple receive chains and making most efficient use of airtime during that transmission. Because in Wi-Fi it's half duplex and everything CISO, I had to listen, make sure nobody else was transmitting, and then once I was confident nobody else was transmitting, I'd transmit. We're gonna go over that in just a second too, okay? So MIMO benefits, this was all a big deal and there's a couple other benefits you're not seeing here. Before MIMO, every frame, every frame, guys, that was transmitted had to be acknowledged. And that takes up a lot of airtime. Once MIMO got here, we could do what's called packet aggregation and block acknowledgement, meaning we could send multiple frames and get one acknowledgement for them. I know we're moving fast and it was a goal. I don't know if we're gonna make it. We're gonna keep trying here. All right, optional operational layers of 802.11. Well, Wi-Fi only operates at layer one and layer two of the OSI model. There's a few sub layers here we're not really gonna have too much time to talk about, but one thing I wanna make clear is that Wi-Fi we're communicating on a specific frequency or channel. So if we have devices, let's just say that our AP here, he's operating and he is on channel one, okay? And if we have devices that are connected over here, they are gonna be connected on channel one, okay? And if they hear anybody else around them transmitting, maybe this guy over here, he's talking to an AP down the hall, and it's also operating on channel one. Uh, and these guys can hear each other, but the APs can't, or any which way, the APs can hear each other. And many times that happens too. Then guess what? You're interfering for the same channel, okay? It's called co-channel interference, CCI or ACI, adjacent channel interference. There's all different types of interference and there's all different types of non 802.11 sources that can interfere with Wi-Fi as well. So the most important thing whenever it comes to 802.11 Wi-Fi is you do proper planning and design. By far, 100% of wireless issues stem from poor planning and design, 100%. All right guys, so let's continue on here. Uh, three types of 802.11 frames you need to know about. It's not just one type like 802.3. There's actually three freaking types of frames and many subtypes of frames. The three main types is management, control, and data. Now, management frames exist just to advertise, maintain, and support a wireless LAN. Control frames were a technique to help avoid collisions, and I guess they still are in a way, right? But now we also use them, yeah, we use them to avoid collisions and also to uh, properly use the channel, okay? Now that we have live in a world of MIMO, then we have to have a way to ask the AP what bandwidth and resources I'm gonna have available for my conversation. And we use control frames again for that purpose. Originally control frames were an additional mechanism to avoid interference but now we use them for a lot of different purposes. And the data frames are the actual data that's transmitted. That's the other fun thing you gotta know about Wi-Fi. There's a ton of overhead just for using Wi-Fi. And it's amazing. I remember whenever I first started learning about 802.11 Wi-Fi back in the day, and this was you know late 90s, maybe early 2000s, and I'm telling you, I was surprised it works at all because there's so much freaking overhead, but, Whenever you talk about uh, waves and RF that's being modulated 2.4 or 5 billion times per second, there's a lot of room in there to get data through, okay? So, 802.11 frames have a lot more room and a lot more things going on with them than 802.3 data frames. If you're familiar with an 802.3 data frame, this is a classic 802.3 data frame. You got a source MAC address, you got a destination MAC address, uh, you got the data unit and a frame check sequence. That's about it. Well, we just said 802.11, there's actually three categories of frames. 
only one of them actually sends data, but these management frames, we could have up to, in actually any of these frames, we could have up to four unique MAC addresses, okay? Because we might need to specify, for example, a PC that's transmitting to another PC and using wireless bridges between them. We have to have room to identify all that. Remember, 802.11 only works at layer one and layer two of the OSI model, okay? So there's quite a bit going on here with that. All right, so an example frame flow. Now, I got a new station, I turn on its WLAN adapter, and the AP's there, what's going on? So AP's, the minute I advertise a WLAN or an SSID, that advertisement is sent every 100 milliseconds or 10 times a second by the AP saying, hello, I'm here, somebody noticed me, and every SSID I create is gonna be advertised every 100 milliseconds or 10 times a second for every radio you have, saying, hello, I'm here, somebody noticed me. Now, clients can either passively scan or actively probe to join that network, okay? So whenever you first turn on your client, if you've never connected to it before, your client's gonna sit there and either listen for those beacons to learn about the WLANs that are available, or if he's connected to a network before, he might have a saved network profile and he might ask the AP, hey, do you have this network? And the AP responds back, well, yes, I have this network. And then the client goes, great, I wanna authenticate. And the AP goes, great, you can authenticate. And then I go, great, I wanna associate. And the AP goes, great, you can associate. And all of this stuff happens before any data is actually transmitted. So it's pretty cool. And actually, uh, the authentication we use nowadays happens after association. So there's a lot going on with Wi-Fi. If anything, guys, and I see we're at 30 minutes now, if anything, I hope that this crash course in this sparks your interest in this technology. I wasn't able to meet 30 minutes, but I'm still gonna try to keep it flowing and get to the end of it. All right, so data rates are important with Wi-Fi, obviously. And as we learned, different Wi-Fi protocols allow us to achieve a different data rate. But in that ever quest of backwards compatibility, we're gonna lose a lot of performance if you have properly designed networks. So there's three different types of data rates. There's mandatory supported and disabled. And long story short, if your lowest mandatory data rate in a cell is where the AP advertises those beacons every 100 milliseconds saying, hello, I'm here, somebody noticed me. And I can modulate a one meg data rate really far away from the AP. And also I could let a lot of legacy devices that can't talk modern speeds onto the WLAN. And if I do that, I'm potentially slowing everybody down. Now, here's the thing. We optimize a lot of times with our data rates I'm not gonna go into this because we've already busted our time, but bottom line is, is those management frames are sent so everybody in the cell could hear us. But with Wi-Fi, one concept I do wanna go over is we use what's called adaptive, uh, adaptable data rates. So if I have a legacy client where I can speak one meg outside of listening for all the management frames, right? Because management frames are always gonna be sent at the slowest mandatory rate in the cell, is way out at the end of the cell, but if I am you know, a HT client or I'm a, I am a VHT client, I'm never gonna talk one meg except for responding to the management frames or doing probe requests or any other type of management function. I'm gonna talk at my optimal data rate. So here's the other fun thing with Wi-Fi is that we use many data rates per transmission. So I'm always gonna send portion of the data at a very slow speed so everybody in the cell can hear me. And that's one of the ways that we avoid interference. With wired networks, we use a concept called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. In Wi-Fi, we can't detect collisions the way we did with wired networks. We can't shock people over the air. It'd be cool if we could, but we can't. So with Wi-Fi, we have to use what's called collision avoidance. In our implementation, that's called DCF, okay? And that's our old implementation. We got a new implementation, but the point is, is that we have equal access to the cell. AP has equal access and clients have equal access. So it's a very, whoever can transmit, whoever uh, reaches zero first, whenever they count down, they're gonna be able to do a quick clear channel assessment and transmit. And this is another fun topic that opens up a can of worms and I really wanna go into all of it, but uh, yeah, we use multiple data rates to send in a cell. So as part of this DCF process, station picks a number, counts down, and this is the legacy way, but it's still very important to understand this. So pick a number countdown, whenever we reach zero, we transmit. But let's say another station, station B is about to transmit. Well, they would transmit first after they did a quick clear channel assessment and made sure there was not enough energy to think that it was Wi-Fi that was being transmitted in the cell. 
then that station is going to announce that they're going to transmit taking up X amount of time slots. Okay, so they need the network for this long. Let's say that B needed to transmit. He said, I'm transmitting for 10. Well, I'm counting down. I'm at three. I'm going to add that 10 to my uh, timer and continue counting down. And then whenever I reach zero, I'm going to transmit. But I'm going to transmit first the first portion of my message saying, hey, everybody else, stay off the network for this long. And then I will transmit my actual data at the optimal rate I think I can transmit it at. And the only way that I know it's successful, boys and girls, is if the AP sends me an acknowledgement. Otherwise, I don't know that the transmission was successful and I would need to retransmit. So every frame transmitted with legacy protocols must be acknowledged. And with our newer protocols like 802.11n, AC, AX, we can do packet aggregation and block acknowledgement. So we can send multiple frames now and get one acknowledgement for them. That is a capability now, but no way, no matter what number of Wi-Fi you're hearing about, no matter what the marketing says, Wi-Fi is 100% still half duplex, okay? Even with the multi-user stuff, the multi-user MIMO, all that, yeah, still 100% half duplex. Now, whenever that station transmits, guys, he also includes the amount of time it takes for the AP to acknowledge him, which is pretty cool. All right, so a couple different acronyms I'm gonna leave you with, and then we're gonna wrap up this quick crash course. <laughs> Uh, communicating in the cell. So first of all, the name you give to a wireless service is called a service set identifier or SSID. Now that's just used to identify that the service is available. What your host is actually connecting to in a wireless cell is in fact the AP's MAC address or one of its MAC addresses. APs use a pool of MAC addresses and it's base 16. So you could have up to 15 SSIDs on a radio, for example. Now, you would never want 15 SSIDs on an AP. In fact, I tell clients, you get two SSIDs, sell me on a reason why you need a third, okay? That's what I tell everybody. We use AAA to assign network permissions and VLANs and ACLs and all that kind of stuff. Now, most clients will end up with a third for certain reasons, okay? But we wanna limit the number of SSIDs we use because remember, there's a ton of overhead in Wi-Fi. The AP is gonna be sitting there no matter what, if the radios are up, he's gonna be sitting there going, hello, somebody noticed me. Every 100 milliseconds, 10 times a second for every SSID. And if it gets too bad and your neighbors have too many SSIDs and their neighbors have too many SSIDs, then you could end up with a situation where nobody can even use the wireless LAN at all. Everybody's gonna be going around going, the network sucks, and it's because you're stepping on each other with unnecessary services running, okay? All right, so we communicate with Wi-Fi at layer one and layer two of the OSI model. Layer one is the RF, layer two is the MAC uh, layer. And so whenever I transmit something, I am saying that it's from my MAC address to this MAC address, and I am connected on that channel. Whenever I join that channel, the AP is operating on a specific channel. Any client in the cell is operating and associated with the AP is also operating on that specific channel. So if you ever wanna hear a wireless conversation, you need to be on that channel as well. Now, once the AP receives the frame, the AP is going to take the frame that's in that 802.11 frame format that we looked at earlier. He's gonna take it and rip it apart and forward it uh, via 802.3 on the wired side of the interface. Okay, so even if uh, this host A over here is communicating with host E over here, then they're not gonna communicate directly, right? In a BSS or an ESS, they're not gonna communicate directly. They're gonna communicate using the AP. So station A, if he needed to transmit over here to this guy, uh, he would pick a number countdown whenever I read zero, I'd transmit, the AP would acknowledge me, and then he would forward that frame uh, to the wired side of the network. Host A's MAC address, actually looks like he lives right there in the network in that cam table, believe it or not. E would be the same thing. His MAC address would be over here in the cam table as well. Uh, and they would both look like they're on the wired side. But if they want to communicate with each other, then they would have to do so through the AP in a BSS. BSS is the uh, name of a basic service set, okay? And the MAC address of the AP uh, that is matched to every WLAN, so the SSID is Blue Wi-Fi, and there's a what's called a BSS ID, uh, basic service set ID, which is actually the layer two address that you're connecting to, to transmit data in a wireless cell. Okay. All right. So communicating in the cell, I need the network for so many time slots. 
the AP is going to wait. He's going to acknowledge him, and then the next person can transmit. And so that's how we share access. We pick a number, we count down. Whenever we zero, we transmit, and we tell everybody at first, stay off the network for this long. And then that way, everybody just gets this timer. They don't have to understand that I'm about to send a, a data frame at 300 megs. All they have to understand is to stay off the network for X amount of time, but they need to be able to hear you, and the AP needs to be able to acknowledge you for that to be successful, okay? And then after the AP gets the message, then the AP is gonna convert that bad boy to 802.3 after an acknowledgement and send it out the wired interface, like you see there. All right. Guys, <laughs> I tried. We're at 40 minutes, so I tried. Hopefully, if anything, I feel like, man, there's just so much more I want to share with you guys and tell you guys about 802.11 Wi-Fi. I'm very passionate about Wi-Fi. I love it. I was kind of, you know, promoted into Wi-Fi early on in my career. Nobody else wanted to deal with it, and I've had a very blessed life because of it, and uh, I've really enjoyed, you know, my career because of it. But uh, if anything, guys, there's no better time to start learning 802.11 based Wi-Fi or any wireless technology for that matter than today. We've got so many cool things coming out and enterprises rely on it for access. If you notice, so many people aren't even putting in Ethernet ports in their laptops. Now, that does not mean wired networks are going away whatsoever. There's a lot of people making a lot of big statements like that out there. That's not the case. It just means that the, the most common access devices today are portable. They're mobile and they're not going to, you know, that's not going to change. And there's a lot of enterprises doing what's called all wireless offices. So that just means all the clients don't have a wired connection. That doesn't mean that there's still not wired connections on the back end connecting the servers, the switches, and all the other devices. It just means all the client devices are uh, wireless devices. So if you like this and you want to continue on learning some of the foundational elements of 802.11 Wi-Fi. I invite you to come to Wi-Fi training. Uh, we've got a few different digital courses out there that will definitely help you on your way. And we're also looking at posting those on Udemy as well as a partner network. And uh, if you love Wi-Fi, you love what you're doing, you work with uh, Cisco, you work with any vendor, we are an authorized training center for both Cisco and also CWMP. We do these courses because we want to raise awareness and we want to help people get into this exciting field okay uh, you know there's i'm not saying there's too many there's uh, something like 40 50 thousand certified route switch experts in the world okay and we just certified a few hundred wireless experts in the world and that that disparity kind of trickles down at all layers of it so i i think you'd be doing yourself a favor to learn more about 802.11 wi-fi and uh, i hope you enjoyed this lesson i hope it piqued your curiosity and I wish you the best of luck. Let me know what you think and uh, stay in touch. Cheers.